Welcome to High Noon, where we talk about controversial subjects with interesting people, and occasionally we let Emily Jashinsky uh, join the interesting band of High Noon guests. Um, every month, we talk to Emily Jashinsky, who is the culture editor over at The Federalist. She's a senior fellow with us at IW, uh, and she does um, counterpoints every week with Ryan Grimm on Breaking Points podcast with Crystal and Sager. And uh, am I forgetting she's often on Megan Kelly's podcast? What you have you have another hat? Yaff, Yaff. Oh yeah. No wonder you're busy. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just a, it's a minor part time job. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, anyway, Emily carves out a, a uh, time in her busy media schedule to come talk to us once a month. And actually, the first thing that I wanted to talk to her about is about media, um, which normally I wouldn't really be into the story because to me, it's kind of a pox on everyone's house involved in this. Um, but the former RNC chair, Ron McDaniel, went to MSNBC as a contributor, apparently for a $300,000 contract. Um she <laughs> lasted all of, you know, 30 seconds before a bunch of the hosts at, at um, NBC came out and said, our, and this is a quote, sacred airwaves um, <laughs> are being polluted by having this person who has questioned the 2020 election on our airwaves. Um, this is totally inappropriate. Basically slamming their own bosses for hiring Ronna McDaniel as a commentator. Um, what... Do you, I mean, this is sort of predictable, but also I feel like it's um, it's really indicative of a media that absolutely refuses to hear what half of the country says at any given time and then acts shocked that that half of the country exists. Uh, I mean, this is, to your point, like exceedingly predictable, um, especially, you know, post-Trump, um, where anybody, they've drawn this red line and you've heard it repeatedly from Rachel Maddow, you've heard it from Chuck Todd, you've heard it from Nicole Wallace, all of these NBC or, or MSNBC hosts uh, who've come out and expressed solidarity uh, with Chuck Todd and the people in the newsrooms, they say, who uh, were just totally caught off guard. They weren't consulted. That was, I think, something that Joe Scarborough complained about um, when you know, they decided to sign their network decided to sign Ronna McDaniel. Uh, the red line is the sand in the sand is apparently that Ronna McDaniel uh, was flirting with Donald Trump's 2020 election denialism. What they see is Donald Trump's 2020 election denialism. Now, I think Ronna McDaniel went further than I would have on these election questions, although I know a lot of really smart people who said, you know, it was mostly posturing. And in fact, she didn't go far enough at sort of investigating some of the lawfare and bad policies that were passed during COVID. Uh, but the bottom line is Ronna McDaniel is uh, not it's closer to the center than Trump on the question of election denialism. And that puts her closer to the center than Trump on uh, it, than Trump's voters on this question of what happened in the 2020 election, which is really important to a whole lot of Republican voters. So NBC should be able at the very least to sustain a contributorship with Ronna McDaniel, let alone actually putting somebody who would openly and ardently defend the Trump position on the election on the airwaves, because in a healthy media, they would have complete and total confidence in putting anyone uh, who is with Trump on the election on their airwaves and then absolutely knocking down conspiracies and lies and, uh, you know, incorrect facts. And that's actually more helpful for the country. You know, give daylight to the nonsense if you think it's nonsense and uh, debate it, you know, argue it down, uh, you know, just absolutely hammer it with facts, which is what Kristen Welker did in uh, Ronna McDaniel's initial appearance on the network. Apparently, I guess it's going to be her first and last appearance on the network, um, or one of nice the paycheck for one nice uh, nice evening's work. Uh, nice paycheck. Yep. Um, and so again, this is just like from the networks. There's a hypocrisy angle. There's a business angle, and there's a journalism angle. The hypocrisy angle is that they platformed everyone from Jamie Raskin to Jerry Nadler, who called the election of 2016, quote, tainted, to Stacey Abrams, who continues to insist she's the rightful governor of Georgia. Um, they have given these people enthusiastically 
platforms over the last, you know, de almost decade at this point. Um, then we could get into the crazy facts that they got wrong about sex and gender, about COVID. I mean, if we're drawing red lines, uh, how about all of those facts? So that part is stupid. The business part is stupid because people are increasingly um, gravitating towards sources where they just trust the biases. You know, they want to hear what the person who's openly on the right says, and they want to hear what the person openly on the left says. Um, so from a business perspective, like hiring Ronnie McDaniel was already like, you probably should have hired someone more hardcore, but the last thing you should have done is fired the person who's just slightly hardcore. So that's already dumb enough. Uh, and then from a journalism perspective, it's just absolute malpractice uh, to not platform voices uh, that disagree with you and to start drawing these red lines in the sand um, because you're not doing your duty of, you know, seeking truth and allowing viewers to decide you're treating yourself as the gatekeeper. So anyway, all this is to say it's messed up. <laughs> um, what do you think is the right balance uh, for people who want to make a point that disagrees? Forget about, you know, NBC in particular, but what is derisively called the mainstream media? And I know um, you don't like that, that phrase very much, the corporate media, whatever you want to prefer, but there is like a, sort of faux mainstream ability that these outlets have, um, they're still a shred of, like, they, they are relying on kind of the fumes of a air of respectability that they haven't earned for the last 20 or 30 years. And every, you know, trust in media poll shows that in particular in the last, you know, five to 10 years, they've really thrown it out the window. All that being said, you know that, like, this was very predictable. I think from the beginning, you and I and probably a million other people <laughs> could tell, oh, this is where this, this was going to end up, Ron McDaniel at, at NBC, right? Um, what, in your view, is the balance between talking to these outlets and trying to bring a point to an audience that doesn't ever get to see it? Mm -hmm. um, a point that might be by the actual strict definition of mainstream, incredibly mainstream. I'm thinking here about, like... I think Megan McCain was a huge value add on, on the view mm -hmm. because not because she, I mean, she's, she's very moderate on a lot of things. Um, but like the, some of the things that she would say about, for example, being pro gun or whatever, they were like 65% positions in the United States. And to watch how those points would trend because of the reaction of all of her other co-hosts, like she had said something that was, let's say a 5% view or a 1% view. When in fact her views were very, very mainstream, um, I think that was a really valuable thing. Yeah, I agree. I and, just don't and, know because, like, on the other hand, these outlets don't. The only time that you're invited onto these outlets, and I'm sure you've had this experience, I've had this experience, they will reach out to somebody for commentary, but the the topic will be, I see that on this thing you have disagreed with Donald Trump. Would you come on here and trash Donald Trump? Right. Right. And I've always said no to those because, <laughs> like, they're, they're not, that doesn't seem productive. But on the other hand, like, you do want to share points of view that their audience. Anyway, you, you know what I'm going with this. Like, how do you balance uh, being able to share a view that an audience doesn't get with the inherent unfairness of it and the way that it's treated and the way that they're likely to shape e any comments or any, like, nuance that you give a question, essentially turning you into a club against the very, you know, sort of values that you believe in. Yeah, this is like also kind of inside baseball uh, for people outside like conservative DC media circles. But that is a, a deep and profound question. I think a lot of people have been asking themselves, um, you know, always, but especially since the rise of Donald Trump, uh, when you increasingly have places like CNN saying everybody who voted for Donald Trump is a racist. Um, when you have uh, Russia collusion, Kavanaugh smears that are uh, basically complete conspiracy theories that are actually like much more conspiratorial than things we think of, of, you know, crazy conspiracy theories that we are like, oh, that's nuts. Uh, like Russia collusion was, was nuts. Um, and yet they went on for years and years uh, as media institutions. And so a lot of people will still say, you need to go on these platforms. Uh, you know, we need Ronna McDaniel because otherwise we won't get uh, any even like moderately pro-Trump voices in these spaces. So sneak in there. 
um, and you know, do your thing. But Ronald McDaniel actually kind of showed why that argument is wrong. Because the first thing Ronald McDaniel did when Kristen Welker asked her in this debut interview, why she didn't condemn openly her principal, Donald Trump's uh, claims about the election being stolen. Ronald McDaniel said, well, you know, when you work for the party, you kind of got to take one for the team. And now I get to be more myself. So when profit is on the line, $300,000, when getting invited into those, you know, sacred airwaves, as Nicole Wallace dead seriously put it. I can't uh, believe she said that with a straight face. It's amazing. And yet she I did. I thought that, that was like commentary from the right. And then I went and listened to the clip. No, she said it. She said sacred airwaves. Well, and on the hypocrisy angle, Nicole Wallace defended the Bush administration during the Iraq war. Like a lot of people did a lot of well-meaning, you know, people that I respect did, but Nicole, Wa like, as long as we're drawing red lines in the sand, why is that not a bridge too far? Uh, but Ronna McDaniel, you know, flirting with Donald Trump's election, uh, still is like Sidney Powell stuff. That's the bridge too far. Um, uh, it's just so stupid. But the first thing Ronna McDaniel did was essentially cave and say, I can be more myself now, which implies that previously she was lying. I mean, that, that is the clear implication of that. And people here politely will call it spinning. You just kind of have to do the best job that you can. Um, you never, you know, outright lie, but you, uh, you know, kind of find creative ways to dodge things. And, you know, as th the public knows, that's what ha what's happening. Uh, but I think Ron McDaniel proved why that argument about just throwing conservative voices in corrupt, broken media spaces is not really the solution. The solution is to empower the new spaces so that they these uh, networks have serious competition uh, so that, you know, you're giving uh, you, when they want to sign Ron McDaniel, uh, they have to work extra hard to prove that they're going to be fair to her. Um, and I feel like Ronna McDaniel didn't even ask for that proof in this case. Like, why would she want to be a part of it? You know, she's still justifying it probably on those grounds that it's better to have those spaces full of Republicans uh, than not. But it's a BS argument if you're just going to say, well, that's not me anymore. So, I, I mean, empower the new spaces, give the old spaces competition and incentive to do better. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> there is, it does really uh, encapsulate the relationship that Donald Trump has with the establishment which of the Republican Party, which is really weird. Um, and not, I feel like the nuances of that relationship are not fully appreciated by almost any part of the political spectrum in a weird way. Um, because on the one hand, obviously there's tension both in the goals and presentation and like, and personalities or there's a huge rift between Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump. And like, obviously that rift is there and has been there since Donald Trump started running, uh, in 2015. Right. On the other hand, the parts of the establishment as Donald Trump became the face of the Republican party, the parts of the establishment that are sort of it, like, it's almost that they go really far exactly in the like um sort of radical direction of always saying yes donald trump in public and being afraid to criticize him in any way but at the same time obviously fight everything that he actually wants to do and then i don't know for me as, as somebody who's like conservative and and likes donald trump for certain reasons and dislikes other things that donald trump does like on substance it's very frustrating because like <laughs> they say they mouth these really um, like obsequious platitudes about Donald Trump and how great he is, but then they actually try to thwart the what I think are some important corrections that Donald Trump brought to the party. And I feel like this is just the perfect encapsulation with Ronald McDaniel of that, right? Where she, when she was at the RNC, she was willing to say anything, which I guess is part of the position, um, but she was willing to say anything to back up Donald Trump. But then, like, takes this gig at, at NBC and is, you know, if, if they had allowed her to, she probably would have been quite critical in, in certain ways um, and would have shown herself to be what she actually is, which is a fairly establishment Republican. Um, I don't know. Like, there, there's actually no alignment between how loudly you scream MAGA and how much you're actually opposing or supporting the agenda that Donald Trump pushed. You right. know what I'm saying? Yep. 
uh, which is which is kind of yeah. I mean, I guess that does speak to Donald Trump because he is really easy to manipulate that way. You just say something nice about him; it doesn't matter like all the horrible stuff you've done in the past. That's all gone as long as you say something nice about him today. He's happy. Yeah, and your point about it being frustrating is such a good one because Trump is like the ultimate for some fault of his own, uh, but not certainly just his fault. But he's sort of like the ultimate distraction um, or the ultimate like wall barrier to having some of these good conversations um, because the left has decided, and if it wasn't Trump, they would find other things. You know, they would, they would absolutely find, you know, you said this about COVID, you said that about trans rights. They would find other ways the not point to, is to define the opposition so that it's so circumscribed that essentially you're quibbling, right? So like on yeah. all essential things, being conservative is so far beyond the pale that we can't even have a discussion but if you'll you'll pa you'll, you'll sort of pause it to all of the liberal premises. But you know maybe you want to counterbalance the arguments for lower taxes or whatever it is. Um, then they'll 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 accept that quibble and they'll call that opposition or having a real debate. And it's a debate that doesn't reflect the country at all. In fact, to your point, Joy Reid said on MSNBC, "I want more Republican voices on our airwaves. I as want long more as they on every relevant thing." She she specifically said, "I want more Adam Kinzingers and Liz Cheney's." And again, to your point, she is going to have Adam Kinzinger on to talk about salt deduction or to talk about uh, Ukraine all day every day and you know at some point what she's gonna do adam beware is call you racist for supporting a tax cut but she's not there right now because they're always in obsessed with trump and ukraine and their pet causes that adam kinzinger will gladly line up behind but they don't want like what they want to do and they actually really believe this uh, Trump is just sort of, in some ways, it's frustrating to your point because he doesn't do himself any favors and he allies with Sidney Powell and whomever and gets into these. Well, and some of these establishment people, as long as they say, I love Donald Trump and then proceed to undermine him and his policies for the next, you know, two years. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's it's extremely frustrating. And then on the other hand, they're going to find any other excuse under the sun for his why, why that, you know, you just saw this with um Oh, gosh, what was like a New York Times story about how Twitter is now riddled with conspiracy theories. It's like all they did was talk about Russia collusion on Twitter for years and Elon Musk didn't own it. Uh, it's, there's like a lack of critical thinking, but it's also just because they're in such a thick bubble that they genuinely um, attribute MAGA wackoism to everybody who disagrees with them um, on things, on these like things about the election, about COVID, about trans issues. If you don't told the line, you are misinformed. If you're a Hispanic who has been listening to radio about why Joe Biden is taking steps to act like, uh, you know, a socialist, you're just misinformed. You just have bad facts. You couldn't possibly be exercising critical thinking and coming to a different conclusion than Nicole freaking Wallace. I mean, you're out there on your, on your own on this one, Emily. I, I personally did not see a single piece of completely ridiculous bullshit on Twitter before Elon Musk got it. I know, right? I, I haven't seen a single crazy thing. It was just before, Elon. Or like two years ago. This is brand new. We're not used to it yet, but, you know, God willing, we'll be able to purge Twitter of the wrong thing and the conspiracies. All right. Well, uh, on that note, uh, we can change topics here uh, to talk again in part about the media. Uh, but I think there, there's a larger underlying issue here, which is the the resurgence of Christine uh, Blasey Ford. She's doing the media tour. She's getting all kinds of hard hitting questions like, was it really hard for you to tell your story? What gave you the courage <laughs> to go on? <laughs> um so, you know, what do you make of, of sort of the return? She has a book, obviously, and this is the opportunity to do, by the way, the tour that includes flying to places like New York to be on The View, which <laughs> famously she was too afraid to fly to testify originally. Anyway, apparently that's changed along with a lot of other things about her story. But um, so what do you make of the return of Christine Blasey Ford? 
I basically think it means the media has learned absolutely nothing. Um, and I saw someone saying they thought the return of Christine Blasey Ford was sort of muted wow. that, you know, in a, a previous era, if Christine Blasey Ford had written this book a couple of years ago, there would be even more sort of shouting from the roof rooftops, look at this feminist hero. But I really disagree with that. I mean, do I think there could be more? Sure. But she got this super cushy eight minute segment on 60 minutes where they spent a minute on questions about why nobody who was allegedly at the party that night remembers it the way you do. Uh, do you think that, you know, hurts the credibility? Of, like this is this kind of meta question about the allegations, not, you know, why does your friend Leland Kaiser, uh, who is anti-Kavanaugh, completely disagree that this ever could have happened? No, nothing like that, of course, but just a, a minute of, of some meta questions about whether her credibility is intact and then moving on to uh, this, this feminist icon narrative. She is the new Anita Hill the View said, quote, we're not going to rehash the allegations right at the top. And in fact, nobody did ask any questions about the allegations. Again, well, that's convenient water. because as soon as you start rehashing the allegations, everybody remembers how thin they were. Right. Yes, of course. Of course. And like the Blasey Ford allegation and Molly Hemingway obviously wrote a literal book on this with Carrie Severino. But um you know, Molly points out that the Blasey Ford allegations, thin as they are, were the least crazy of all of the crazy allegations that were tossed at Brett Kavanaugh during this confirmation hearing. But there are so many questions about Christine Blasey Ford's credibility that could be asked. Um, you know, Ronna McDaniel, actually, this is kind of interesting. This was in like 2019. I asked Ronna McDaniel, speaking of Ronna, um, about the Kavanaugh allegations and, you know, how she think that, how she thought, whether that did animate something in the Republican party. And she told me she had donors that had not, they, they called her, they had not called the RNC in years, picked up the phone and said, I'm, I've been giving to Democrats or I haven't given to Republicans in years, but I'm giving you because of what's happening to Brett Kavanaugh, uh, because I think it is such BS. And I think Democrats are just now like on smear campaigns, using them as political weapons, which again, we saw this happen with Anita Hill, but people thought it was, it was really on another level. You had no media scrutiny. Democrats just totally swallowed this whole cloth. Uh, slightly different than what happened with Anita Hill, not that there wasn't bias and, uh, you know, acceptance, um, you know, where it might not have been due among Democrats. But the point is, uh, with Kavanaugh, it was just a, a complete information operation uh, that the media swallowed and went along with. And there's so many legitimate questions that aren't being asked now, despite the cushy media coverage. There's a piece in The Atlantic that reflect reflected uh poetically on how Christine Blasey Ford, quote, came forward as a scientist. I mean, Atlantic, CBS, The View, even just The Atlantic and CBS, these are, that's a big deal to get a cushy package in those, uh, in those spaces. And I don't think we should be numb to that. I think it is a big deal that they haven't learned and they still aren't exercising journalistic due diligence here. Yeah. I mean, I, I also think it's a, a big deal. And the reason is, uh, you, you kept referring to Anita Hill. Um, first of all, as bad as the Anita Hill accusations were, and as grounded, ungrounded, in fact, um, in any kind of corroboration as they were, they were a lot more credible than Christine Blasey Ford's. Mm -hmm. uh, for this reason, at least everybody agrees that Anita Hill actually worked for Clarence Thomas and was multiple times, you know, many, many times in contact with Clarence Thomas, right? Um, in fact, part of what came out during her testimony is that she followed Clarence Thomas from job to job, but um, apparently there were, you know, some romantic attachments on her side that she was following this guy around, right? Um, in, but I, I, I want to bring up Anita Hill because this shows that the mainstream media space that we were talking about, whether we like to call it mainstream media or not, it kind of is. Mm -hmm. And it does retain the fumes of that power. And Anita Hill is a perfect example of that because they did the same rehabilitation tour for Anita Hill. During the, the hearings, during Clarence Thomas's hearings, um, the vast majority of Americans did not find Anita Hill's testimony credible. Um, I, I've read a bunch of polls uh, during yeah. the era. Most of them are in the 30s of people who supported Anita Hill. Now, there were still stickers all over the country from the hardcore libs. I believe you, Anita, right? But like almost only pure political partisans for the left you got numbers that were basically like 65, 35, or even 70, 30 um, against her testimony when she actually gave it. Fast mm -hmm. forward today, 
it looks a lot more like 50 50. So, in a lot of polls, the majority of people believe Anita Hill to the extent that they remember who she is. And what happened in those intervening 30 years, which is, of course, completely unfair to Clarence Thomas, who will forever have this, um, you know, out there about him, but uh, this like false story about him um, and his behavior. The, the reality is like that kind of soft media campaign for 30 years, the like, you know, the, the, the cushy interviews afterwards, all of the, the news hosts who reference her as though her story was unquestionable the way exactly in the way that, that today the, you know, the Atlantic and the view are referencing Christine Blasey Ford's um, as and not going through the specifics of the allegations, putting aside those specifics that look so bad for the accusers. Right. And just, kind of rolling over as though no rebuttal had ever happened. Um, <laughs> Did and, the HBO movie? You remember yeah. the HBO movie a couple years ago? Yep. Yes, there's an HBO movie. I think it's HBO. I can't remember if it was Netflix. HBO. There, there is it was HBO. No. There is a like essentially a lifetime movie about Anita Hill, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and it worked. It worked. Uh, in terms of, of changing people's minds about this, that media blitz and just blowing past the facts, which, which in Christine Blasey Ford's case are, there is not a shred of corroborating evidence that she was ever in the same room with Brett Kavanaugh, that she ever met Brett Kavanaugh. All of the witnesses that she called from that night said they don't remember anything of the kind. They don't remember the incident at all, let alone like the specifics of what she said that Brett Kavanaugh did. They don't even remember this party or hanging out with Brett Kavanaugh. Okay. Um, her own father has apologized to uh, Brett Kavanaugh's parents, I think. Um, her, as you say, her friend has kind of rep repudiated some, no no friend of like Brett Kavanaugh's or something, but, the, but she's calling on these people to essentially corroborate her story and not one of them was willing to do it um, because that's not how they remember what happened. Uh, and then on top of that, she doesn't have any specifics. So it's like being accused in the star chamber, right? It's, it's, I don't know exactly what day it is. I don't know, you know, I don't even have a, a week. I don't even have like any specifics. I don't know what house, I don't know where it happened, right? Like it, it's basically account for your life for a, a several year period. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's no defense against that. And, and yet with all of the, those obvious problems that were, you know, the reason that the polls ended up pretty good for Brett Kavanaugh after those hearings is because the process of having her testify and then having him testify brought forward and having that um, lawyer for the GOP who was asking her some of those specific questions that she couldn't answer, right? Um, all of that is what, what made it clear that a story that sounded pretty bad on the face of it did not have a lot of corroboration and not a lot of credibility underneath it. People are not going to remember that stuff. Mm-hmm. They're going to remember the headline at The Atlantic about how brave she was to come forward and tell her story. Well, and I think that's an important point because I was thinking about this too, that this round of praise for Christine Blasey Ford uh, actually really boosts her credibility because it's sort of like if you're looking back through the historical record and you know, you're, and I'm saying this like as someone who researches for journalistic purposes, sometimes you go back and you look at kind of how people were treated um, after the initial situation happened. And, you know, sometimes you assume that if they're given really favorable treatment, I shouldn't say assume, but sometimes if people are given really favorable treatment, you're like, okay, well, uh, you know, maybe that means they were vindicated or something like that. And obviously, you know, as a good journalist, you always keep digging, although some don't, but for the American people, for the public, this is going to be used to disqualify Supreme court opinions. How old is Brett Kavanaugh? Like 50? Like it could, I mean, seriously, it could be for another 50 years, uh, but at least, you know, another 30 years, another 20 years. Think about that. Uh, this is always going to be when people Google Brett Kavanaugh and Brett Kavanaugh makes decisions that go against what the uh, sort of media elite class believes in. This will always uh, not just be hanging over his head as a husband and a father and as a man, uh, but it's going to be hanging over the decisions that the highest court of the land makes. And it's going to be unduly affecting the credibility of those decisions going forward. So it's it's extremely dangerous. And this round of praise, I completely agree with you. It has, com it has 
like the Anita Hill situation, mainstreamed, memory hold the criticism, um, and the media's been able to sort of paper over a climate that at the time was uh, very divided, uh, was was way more charged than this recent round, where it's just like, ah, Christine Blasey Ford's with us. We love Christine Blasey Ford standing up for women. A uh, round of applause, pat on the back. Uh, it really is like journalists like to say they write the first draft of history, but they also write the freaking second draft uh, and they don't really care that much. I mean, I think they do care. It's, it's uh, they care about rehabilitating yeah. this, this story. Um, by the way, this was the scene of my finest moment slash most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to me. Uh, in my career, which is uh, that I was part of a documentary of reactions, live reactions uh, at, over at Vice. Michael Moynihan uh, was in charge of following me around all day, which I had a you know mic strapped to me for, I don't know, eight, 10 hours. I was articulate the entire time. But um, after Brett Kavanaugh came out and tested, I was like genuinely moved because you could see he was a yeah. wrongly accused man angry that somebody would say something so heinous that would destroy his reputation. And I got a little choked up and <laughs> I said, please don't use that piece. Oh. Of course, that's, not only did that get into the documentary, the, the like video of me crying because they won an Emmy for that documentary <laughs> over at Vice. And the video of me crying <laughs> was at the Emmys. So thanks a lot, Michael Moynihan. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Uh, but you know what, Inez? Actually, it was fully appropriate for them to use that because I do think a lot of women, um, there was some reporting to this effect at the time, I think a lot of women watched Kavanaugh's testimony and got choked up too and thought that could be my son, that could be my grandson, that could be my husband. Because at the time, it was like the Me Too fever pitch. It was uh, coming for everyone. And there were some extremely serious allegations, of, as we've talked about before, uh, that actually kind of remind me of what uh, is happening with Diddy at the moment. Uh, like, actually, really serious. Like, this guy isn't just Aziz Ansari, a comedian. He's an extremely powerful business executive. Uh, in addition uh, the to the allegations his, themselves are serious. Yeah. Yeah. The allegations are serious. The scope of the allegations is really serious. Uh, but at the time, there was crazy stuff flying back and forth, and people were genuinely scared about the future. And I think they're still scared about the future. It sort of died down a little bit in the media. But uh, at the time, it was really resonant with people. So I feel like uh, it was good that they used it because it was representative of something not, that was actually happening. Not good for me, because I don't... take one for the team, like oh, Rana. Right. Um, no, but I mean, I think you bring up a really good point, which is the the underlying structure of these issues, leaving aside for a moment, the very important issue of how the media essentially reframes the past and makes it, you know, sweeps away all of the, the response. The reason that the, you know, the public opinion initially was the way it was for Brett Kavanaugh is because he was able to respond. He was able to listen to his accuser and then he was able to take the stand in his own defense and respond in specific. Mm. Right. Um, that's something that's denied to a lot of people whose names aren't as famous or up for as big jobs as Brett Kavanaugh, um, particularly college men uh, who are accused of sexual impropriety. And in, in a lot of cases, they are not given any information about what they're accused of or like what the specifics of it is just sexual impropriety. Before they step into that hearing, they may have never heard <laughs> any of those allegations before. Um in I mean, talking about in specifics, what day, what are you, what are you saying happened? What are you saying that I did? They I don't hear that. They have the entire thing before a single adjudicator who is trained in quote unquote trauma, uh, you know, trauma responsive, whatever. I can't remember the buzz phrase, but uh, basically to dismiss um, any evidence after the fact, a lot of these things are sort of missed hookups, right? Or, um, miss or ambiguous or miscommunication between two people who had sex. Um, they're trained to dismiss any evidence after the alleged incident. So for example, girls texting the guy back and being like, I had such a great time. Like, when can we hang out again? Right. Um, those, that kind of evidence is dismissed as potentially trauma informed, mm -hmm. right? Um, all of this, is something that was very much Joe Biden's baby when he was vice president under Obama. It started under Obama with dear colleague letters sent out to the universities, basically trying to force them into this very, very unfair um, structure of adjudicating these kinds of sexual misconduct claims. Um, and 
under the Trump administration, it went away. Um, huge credit to Betsy DeVos for actually going through the rulemaking process. It's the only reason that it's just now being reversed by the Biden administration and going back to the star chamber model. That model has been repudiated under constitutional due process grounds by, uh, at this point, I think more than 200 federal court cases. It is blatantly unconstitutional. Um, but it's worth it for universities to continue it because they believe in it. And, you know, what is it? One out of, you know, every 20, 50, 100 of these guys, uh, most of them just want it to go away. It's the worst nightmare. Uh, actually has the resources and the, um, you know, will and ability to, to chase these cases down all the way to get them into federal court. Um, and usually when they do, they're vindicated. A lot of these universities end up settling or when they don't end up settling, the court ends up saying this is completely inappropriate. This process is you are not giving due process um, to these men. But it's exactly that that dynamic. Now, obviously, a hearing, a public hearing is not a court case, but it is in that in-between space, just like university, universities dealing with these allegations where you can destroy someone's life. You can destroy their reputation. You can deny them a job. Um, these are not, you know, sort of ephemeral consequences to people's lives. One of the saddest things um, I've ever heard, there's a group called FACE, a wonderful group called FACE, and I can't yes. remember what the acronym stands for off the top of my head, but it's essentially for these young men and their parents. Um, it's in a support group for essentially falsely accused men who have had their lives uh, ruined by these kinds of accusations in many cases. And one of the, the women involved in it, um, one of the mothers was telling me that she knows so many cases within just this small community of attempted suicide and suicide uh, of these men that it's like that at least an attempt to commit suicide is <laughs> just basically de rigueur in this group. It's so common because this is so devastating uh, to to your life to be accused this way. Um, and, you know, uh, we are going back to that model. Um, as soon as the Title IX regulations from the Biden administration are finalized, which is supposed to be any time now, um, we are going back to that model on college campuses. And the, the ability that Brett Kavanaugh had to defend himself, even though that's now being, you know, etched away at by the media uh, after the fact, but the ability that he had to come out and defend himself on the specifics, to hear the charges against him. And that's just in the public forum, right? At least to be able to have his say publicly and to try to convince people like me uh, watching that he did not do this. Uh, that ability is being denied to a lot of people who are a lot less powerful than Brett Kavanaugh right now. Well, I'm really glad that you brought up the impending Title IX changes, which we expect to be very bad and to harken back to the Obama era, because I don't know that either of us anticipated this conversation going in that direction, but it's a huge story and nobody is talking about it. It's a place where you have particular expertise. Um, I actually covered that when I was in college. I'm slightly younger than Inez, uh, but it really was the topic um, for a certain group of millennials throughout their college experience. It was Title IX, Title IX, Title IX. It was rape culture, rape culture, rape culture. It was all of these Jezebel and BuzzFeed headlines. And that happened after the Obama administration decided to put all of this in a quote, dear colleague letter. Uh, this was not you know, passed like it should have been through the Congress. So there's kind of a powers question there, obviously. Well, not kind of, there's a massive powers question there. Uh, it ultimately then was extended to uh, changing sex in Title IX, I mean, gender identity, and all of these super dramatic sweeping changes to the country made at the stroke of a pen. But the Title IX stuff in particular, I think we forget how much that affects us uh, and influences uh, our politics still to this day, uh, because it was one of those, and as I don't know if you agree with this, but I think it was one of those really big sort of testing of the waters um, among kind of the leftists in the Obama administration, like the true believing kind of cultural Marxist type people that Chris Rufo describes. Um, and I, I think they really tested the waters with that. And basically the media issued no criticism of what happened on college campuses until the end of the Obama administration. And then you started to see like the Washington Post and Emily Yaffe had a great series over at the Atlantic that I think was in 2015 on all of this, but basically Obama got away with it. And then Betsy DeVos uh, in some corners of the media was praised when she made reform, but was also in some mainstream areas called like a 
uh, oh, excoriated, an enabler I, of, I, of I, se sexual abuse. I uh, we participated as an outsider. You know, we gave comment and we took meetings and stuff um, in that process, reg regulatory process of putting forward regulations that reverse some of this stuff. Um, I mean, they were excoriated. They they were called like you don't care about rape victims, um, you know, and and all they were doing was restoring the constitutional guidelines of due process. Yeah. That you, you yes, like, you know, rape is a heinous crime. Um, but you got to make sure you actually are punishing someone who did something. Um, and you, you know, due process safeguards are not sort of, quote, anti-victim, right? They're not anti-woman. They're not, you know, pro-man. They are a basic cornerstone of, of the fairness of our justice system. They're pro-victim. Um, our culture at wide. They're yeah. pro-victim because they lend credibility to victims so that uh, they're, so that credible accusations or even, you know, accusations where people, um, you know, you really need to go through the, the legal process to hear them out and to uh, suss out the truth or the truth as close as we can get to it. Um, those have much more credibility when they go through our system of due process. Again, the greatest, you know, legal system that's existed in human history. And we just threw it out the window for uh, shallow identity politics purposes and did it at the stroke of the pen. I mean, it was um, it was a lot of people in the Obama administration were upset about what they did with drones. A lot of people were upset about what happened with DACA and Obama's sort of pen stroke um, legislating uh, from the perch of, you know, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. This was one of the most egregious. And I think this is, you yeah, know, there's something that Joe Biden was very like this was Joe Biden's project. Exactly. That's, That's exactly said. true. Yeah. Um, it's but, about to come back. Of course, by the way, naturally, uh, these these kinds of uh, both in the, the court of public opinion and, and in, uh, in in legal in the legal sense, of course, none of this applied to Tara Reid's accusations against Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. Very important point. Um <laughs> which I also didn't think were particularly credible, by the way. Those Agree, agree. But, but they were also they, more they credible were than Christine Blasey Ford's. Christine Blasey Ford's. Yes, yes. Um, no, I, I, I do think that this is an issue where Democrats sometimes don't see what they're pushing um, and they don't see the potential reaction from particularly mothers. I think mothers of sons see this issue and they get, really scared. And we saw that during Kavanaugh. We saw like the united nature of the right and even of independence. And you would think this is sort of a quote unquote sympathetic issue for the left, right? Um, it It isn't. I think a lot of women in particular, exactly that demographic that both parties are fighting over the, the sort of moderate, um, you know, middle to upper middle class married women um, for the most part in, in the suburbs and, and, I, I think this is an issue that resonates with those women uh, in a way that helps, you know, sort of the side of due process in a way that the left doesn't fully appreciate. And by the way, I'm curious what you think about this uh, analysis. I think this has to do with the fact that the activist base of the Democratic Party is largely unmarried, doesn't have families, um, doesn't have the kind of relationships with men, it is largely single women. Like the, the activist base of the Republican Party is disproportionately single women. And I don't think that bubble has any kind of appreciation for the way that women specifically react, the ones that do have husbands and have sons um, the way, and brothers, like the way that they react to this issue when they see something like the Kavanaugh hearings, I think is totally underappreciated by the left because of who their activists are and the lives that they lead. Yeah, I think that's true. I think Kavanaugh was maybe the best example of that. And we see this again as an example when they are rehabilitating, not rehabilitating, but like extra uh, padding Christine Blasey Ford's totally unearned reputation as a credible witness or a credible accuser. Um, after there were ample signs that what the media did was very divisive and uh, actually uh, exacerbated media distrust. So if we look at uh, media trust, Gallup does a really good annual poll on this. Obviously, we all know it's declined since like the 1970s, but it dipped to a record low in 2016 and then sort of steadily went back up. But it dipped actually back when they did this last fall 
to that record low once again of 2016, which is really interesting. And it's a perfect uh, kind of data point when we're thinking about Ronna McDaniel and Christine Blasey Ford, uh, because the media is basically sprinting in the opposite direction, even though every time there's a major crisis of you know media botching a story, allowing Julie Swetnick and allowing Christine Blasey Ford, frankly, to uh, you know giving them more credibility than they're due and more credibility than typical journalistic standards uh, would allow for. When you're doing that, you always have someone in media being like, ah, I actually went back and looked at this last week when uh, I wrote a piece on Christine Blasey Ford and I went back and looked at it. Joe Scarborough, there were some voices, um, actually like media legal people that were really uncomfortable with the media coverage. There was a conversation on CNN's Reliable Sources hosted by Brian Stelter at the time. That was along these lines of just like, ah, are we going too far? Um, but then every time, even when they have that little voice in the back of their head, that's like telling them, you know, whoever their journalistic hero is, like Walter Cronkite would never do this. Um, every time that occurs to them, they, again, for all of the, the reasons that we've talked about many times, but like the social pressures, uh, the ideological pressures of living in a bubble, Charles Murray shows that the super zip phenomenon is actually new, um, that, you know, people used to mingle with people that are in different social strata uh, economically. And this is sort of new and people aren't used to that yet. So, you know, maybe it's it's also, I mean, it's definitely a combination of those things, but they cannot fix themselves. So anybody like Ronna McDaniel, who thinks that just putting a uh, moderately pro-Trump voice on NBC is going to fix the media or anybody who thinks, you know, if only we had um, you know, somebody on The View to really question Christine Blasey Ford, like uh, Megan McCain was. Um, and Megan was fearless when she was in that position. She absolutely uh, did not take any BS. She was not watered down. Uh, and and that was great for the show. Yeah. It's not the thing I, that's going to... The, the, the View is always... Fit for that show in the sense that she is more... I mean, she's, she's anti-Trump um, for obvious personal reasons and for political ones. Um, but she is, she's relatively moderate in the Republican party, but she's very like firm on the things that she is conservative on. Right. Like, and she doesn't back down from being, you know, pro-life or pro-gun or like, you know, on the issues where like she is on the right, she's very firm about her positions. And previously they had hired a bunch of people basically more or less, um, in that slot. And they continued it afterwards where it is the, like the Kinzinger model, right. Or it, it, it's, it's people who are it's the David French model where <laughs> it's people who are there primarily to criticize the right while appending to the beginning of it as a conservative myself, I hate everything the right is doing right now. Mm. Like, um, no, I, I, I'm wondering if you think that there's a sort of quiet comeback to me too, because as you were talking, I was thinking about, so Yasha Monk, that story got very little airtime yeah. and yet Yasha Monk is not published at the Atlantic anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then you mentioned the Diddy story, which is much more serious, right. Um, and is yeah. criminal and, and, um, but like it's, it seemed for a while that these accusations, it, it's funny because th there was so much blowback against some of these accusations when I feel like the Aziz Ansari, uh, Ansari story that you referenced was kind of the beginning of the end for me too when this woman was saying that she was essentially assaulted because he was a little bit aggressive after a date and stopped when she said stop, but like then she didn't feel comfortable saying stop. <laughs> like. Um, and he picked the wrong kind of wine on the date and he was just a little bit of a bore. Yes. Um, I, I, even as described by her, there was nothing close to assault in the story. Um, and I feel like that was a little bit of a turning point that after that, there was a lot more skepticism applied to some of these Me Too stories. But it's almost like it's shifted where you can put in Yasha Monk's case, which I'm not even going to repeat the details of. She put this accusation out into the world. She emailed it to his boss. He was quietly let go. No stories were written. Nothing was written about it. There was no, like, there was nothing to really engender the blowback, right? Mm. So it was just kind of quietly done. But the effect is the same. Yeah, I think Me Too did permanent damage. Uh, to, it's, it's sort of like the question of, you know, when... 
a hurricane hits a flood wall um and maybe i'm mixing things up now my dad is an engineer and probably a civil engineer probably like you sound like an idiot but uh when uh you know hurricane hits a flood wall let's just go with it um you know that can only withstand so many storms uh, before it totally crumbles, uh, but it gets weaker with everyone. And I feel like with me too, we had this uh, permanent weakening of our standards as to what passes for, you know, there was a huge backlash to me too. And that basically shut down a lot of the future Aziz Ansari stuff, but, uh, and there's been something similar with cancel culture, although it took a really long damn time uh, for that to happen. Uh, but those, these are still really powerful uh, in the media. So while it might not be on page one, it's still happening on page three. And, uh, you know, if you're Yasha Monk, you might not be a headline on CNN, or you might not be a, a breaking news story on CNN's airwaves, but there probably will be a headline about you um, in some paper, and that still does damage. Um, and that still does damage where perhaps it shouldn't. So I do feel like Me Too did permanently sort of reduce our standards and and uh, reduce them to a, a, a weaker, less healthy place. And I don't think that's good for anybody, um, especially, and we know that by the way, because the Biden administration is about to bring all of this stuff back even after Me Too, uh, because stuff that passes, like Yasha Monk, I don't think before, I mean, maybe, in like 2013 or whatever, at the height of the rape culture stuff, someone would have been able to peddle the Yasha Monk story, but definitely not before like 2012. That basically would have gone nowhere before 2012. I don't think a public a, a, an outlet would have uh, run that story, and I don't think um, the Atlantic would have responded to it. Yeah, I'm looking up right now. There was an incredible article because I, at the end of the day, what happens? There are two sort of negative consequences from the dropping of standards that you're talking about. One is the most obvious consequence is people who either were completely innocent um, or who are guilty of being bores and jerks, uh, essentially, have their lives ruined or their professions, uh, professional lives ruined or their reputations ruined um, through this process. And that's obviously, uh, I think, the primary sort of downside, obviously, of, of having this this low standard, which for some time it seemed like the only standard is mere accusation, right? It really was believe all women. If a woman says this happened, that's like the baseline of a story that we're running with. Um, the other category of people who suffer from this are, you know, <laughs> are rape victims or mm -hmm. assault victims who relied on the sort of general sympathy and cachet in society, like essentially coming to their aid in certain circumstances. Um, because by the nature of this crime, it is often without witnesses, right? Most people do not rape in public. Um, and so there, there was a necessary amount of kind of gravity to the accusation that came with a certain seriousness. And I know that this is like the, the exact opposite of what the left says, right? The left says basically the system, the like, um, you know, the cops and the judicial system treat rape victims horribly. That is not, not only not true now, but like even back in the 70s and 80s, they made changes to the federal rules of evidence. <laughs> okay, like they made changes to the mm -hmm. rules in court essentially to preference people who are, are uh, telling stories of sexual assault um, to try to protect them in court even from excessive investigation, for example, into their sexual histories, right? Which otherwise would come in. Um, and so even the rules of evidence are sort of stacked in, on behalf in, in this way that other you know, victims of various crimes don't have in the legal system. Um, and this is not new. This is from the 70s. This is from the 80s. Um, but there's this perception, ubiquitous perception, that because sometimes the judicial system can't do anything about something that might have really happened, but where there isn't enough evidence to convict somebody, and because this crime is inherently, unlike some of these other crimes, right, it's a kind of inherently private and more often than not, it has this, um, you know, sort of lack of evidence, especially as time goes on. The only evidence that can be collected is collected immediately afterwards. And I understand, like, you know, there are going to be a lot of 
female victims who do not want after that experience to go to the hospital, to go to the police. Um, that's like a perfectly understandable reaction to having that happen to you. Which, by um, the way, puts more potential victims in danger uh, because people who should be, you know, actually going through the system. Yeah. Uh, but there, there was this this really fantastic article that was going around, um, and it's it's a good transition because the last topic I want to get to is this kind of um, slew of books about essentially fragility of the younger generation. Um, but there there is this this article going around, and I finally found it here um, from Colette with this this very like, and I I use this um, advisedly. I hate I hate calling people brave, quote unquote, but it really is a, a brave article, Larissa Phillips, um, towards ruin or recovery. I don't know if you saw this, this piece going around Emily. Um, but she talks about her actual very, <laughs> very quote unquote classic, uh, rape, um, where she, she was in, in, um, I can't remember, Florence, I think in Italy. And she was pulled into like a quiet park at late at night, uh, by two strangers, um, and brutally raped. Mm -hmm. Um, and she talked about her experience with, you know, initially not wanting to go to the police, actually exactly because she had uh, read so many things about how she wouldn't be believed and she would be attacked. And um, it turns out, you know, that she was able to convict her her rapists. And in fact, they had other victims. Um, mm -hmm. And but generally the way that she was talking about it is a way of, of um, both taking responsibility, not, of course, for what happened to her, which, you know, was the, the moral decision or the immoral decision of the people who did it. Uh, but by the fact that she was alone late at night, uh, that she didn't have a lot of defense for herself, um, that she's going to be more careful going forward about you know, kind of situational awareness. Um, those kinds of things, taking responsibility on the one hand are forbidden. And then on the other hand, she says, we are giving even act people who this actually happened to, not people who are making up some of these stories that have lack all credibility or are blowing out of proportion things that are really amount to miscommunication between two people in an intimate moment. Um, that even in, in the, the worst of these cases, this, this kind of fragility around um, becoming a victim of this kind of heinous crime doesn't help. Like it doesn't help to see yourself permanently as broken. It doesn't help to go into this with the mentality that the system is going to be against you and you're going to be humiliated. Like you might deny yourself justice that way. And you might deny other victims justice that way. And furthermore, you might allow this basically to govern your life going forward. And I, I want to make this transition here uh, before we wrap up. There's been a series of books that have come out um, and I feel like they're connected in theme. One is Timothy Carney's book, Family Unfriendly. Um, the next is Abigail Schreier's book, Bad Therapy, Why the Kids Aren't Growing Up. I'm going to have Ron hopefully shortly to talk about uh, this one, which I've read too. Um, and all of this is around how to, to, to create young people who actually are not fragile, even when inevitably, you know, ho ho fortunately not all of us have to face what, what this woman faced in terms of violent rape, but like people face adverse circumstances in their lives. And across the board, and we have Jonathan Haidt's book coming out about social media as well in this same category, and, and all of the data around how people in Gen Z, and then also the under the the one coming up behind them, the ones who are in high school and, and middle school now, Generation Alpha, are n we are not equipping them um, as they grow up with the ability to be anti fragile, to like come back from any kind of setback in life, and how that is really we're creating a new kind of human that's is unable to deal with life. I feel like there's such an important bridge there. Um, you mentioned Jonathan Haidt. He was the one who wrote The Coddling of the American Mind uh, with Greg Lukianoff back in 2015. And uh, that's now he's writing about, and he's made this correction, this connection directly before. Uh, now he's writing about this completely uncharted territory of uh, a life in the sort of era of smartphones, social media, and abundant Wi-Fi basically being the, the air that we breathe. And the social science on this uh, is becoming 
uh, basically overwhelming. There was a time period where, you know, libertarian think tanks that were getting money from groups like Facebook, Meta and Google, um, you know, they could still look at some studies and say this is inconclusive. And I'm sure they will continue to do that. You know, this is just another new technology like television. Well, television itself is a new technology. And, and Jonathan Haidt is sort of finally uh, not hit, not finally for him, but because he's trusted among the so-called mainstream, he, he's finally mainstreaming this conversation about uh, the connection between that sort of Lashian um, PC, you know, if we're pulling the thread from William F. Buckley to Christopher Lash to Bill Maher in the 90s and Camille Polly in the 90s, and then finally Jonathan Haidt in, and Greg Lukianoff in 2015, putting some of those uh, puzzle pieces together. And what we're seeing now it's it's a combination, but it's also cause and effect. You know, if you uh, if you raise people to you know be increasingly narcissistic and fragile and coddled, uh, then these technologies are going to be more alluring because uh, they play to our worst instincts. Uh, so basically, like where the tech created fertile ground for these trends, and it's only amplifying, like it's only getting worse. You know, TikTok is not entirely dissimilar from TV, which is maybe like a healthier, uh, slightly healthier version of TikTok. And obviously, I love TV, uh, but I would never speak ill of TV. But uh, I might have to here in the sense that, um, you know, there there were ways to cope with TV, um, but there we're increasingly, you know, the technology is developing, as Brett Weinstein and Heather Hying have said, it's it's just developing more quickly than we can cope with, that our bodies can cope with. And a lot of these sort of fragile trends and tendencies, they themselves uh, were canceled at Evergreen State very famously. So it's interesting, the crossover between people who were initially raising the alarm about uh, fragility, sort of psychological and intellectual fragility, are also people who are now increasingly saying there's this uh, phenomenon of kind of hyper novelty being caused by social media and smartphones, uh, because these two things are absolutely connected. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like they're connected, but not like identical uh, in other words um and i think abigail Schreier does a good book in her a good job in her book of, of separating these things um convincingly but i i, I do think that douthat ross douthat had the best formulation of it which is essentially that we have created fragile creatures uh through all kinds of both cultural and economic forces um but that those fragile creatures were not at all equipped as to use your word to cope with the technological change of, you know, in some cases it's, it's, I think it, um, I was listening to Jonathan Hayden. I think he said five hours average five to nine hours. So not including school five hours on, on, um, social media alone for teenagers, teenagers, not like adults who have enough trouble, you know, like we all spend too much time on screens and smartphones, right? And social media. Um, but teenagers with developing brains and, and uh, you know, developing the skill of focus and, and being able um, to, to do something other than social media, uh, five hours a day on social media on average, right? Um, that we, that would be hard enough to deal with if we had strong families, if, our kids were getting enough time outside, like interacting with each other. They were, you know, growing up the way that, you know, you and I did in the, in the nineties, <laughs> not that far apart. Um, if there's, you know, we still had access to some of the, and those things are cultural choices. Um, those things are largely some, there are some like economic and policy that plays through it, but those things are, decisions that people make. And there's our cultural norms that we develop around family, around, um, you know, independence of what age and so on. Like all of this is adding up to an inability to deal with this technolo technological change, which otherwise I'm like not convinced. I, I guess I kind of have a little bit of the libertarian instinct to say, you know what, like, yes, this is, this is earth shaking, but we have dealt with as a species earth shaking technological change before. Now it's had massive upheaval effects. I mean, <laughs> the industrial revolution is essentially driven by technological change. 
But what's different is how we're unable, completely unable to deal with the psychological change because we don't have the underlying foundation to do it. I mean, I think we didn't, you know, as a, like, if you look at obesity rates in the United States right now, we didn't get obese after the wheel was invented uh, because we had plenty of time. You know, cars are a different story, but it took a long time before the invention of the wheel to the invention of the car and the normalization of the car. Um, and I think it's precisely that elongated gap between A and B that allowed us as a species to kind of adjust. Um, you know, we, everyone, it's not like we all started uh, instantly going on hoverboards from, you know, one side of the room to another when the wheel was invented. Um, not that we do that now, but, uh, to go get, you know, to go do what is considered work to go get your food and all of that. Um, you know, now we generally use wheels for it and that's certainly behind, uh, some of these obesity questions. So I do think that it's kind of what we're seeing is the natural process of snowballing, but I don't disagree. Like I actually, I was just recorded a podcast with my colleague, John Daniel Davidson, whose new book comes out today. It's called Pagan America. And you'll actually really like it in us because some of the conversations we've had about the errors in like Patrick Deneen's logic, um, who I really respect Patrick Deneen, but disagree with uh, his conclusion and Adrian Vermeule's conclusion about, uh, you know, small L liberalism. Uh, it doesn't, I don't think it needs to collapse under its own weight. Um, and John writes about how the American version of small L liberalism does not need to collapse under its own weight, can withstand uh, some of these pressures if people revolt and kind of understand, you know, he, you, you may disagree with his conclusion because it's that, you know, you kind of have to uh, accept the faith-based um nature of the American constitution, the American system, but it's an optimistic take in the sense that it's like, we're going to a dark era, but the American system uh, doesn't have to go down that road. So I, I think that's really interesting. Um, I do though, I think the technology is snowballing to a point where, um, you know, it started in ancient times, you know, bronze age, you can keep going down through the ages and uh, the rate is, is just, it's like the snowball at the bottom of the hill, but Who's to say what happens from here? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly, uh, what is it like? I, I do feel like we live in transitionary times. Mm -hmm. And um, things, I think some things, I don't know if it'll be completely dystopian um, or if we'll get a handle on some of these things. But one way or the other, I feel like things will be clearer. Uh, trajectory will be clearer in you know, maybe 10 years or 20 years, but right now it feels extremely transitionary. I want to ask you one question before I let you go. What are you watching now? Since you're such a big, big advocate of TV, I'm going to embarrass you and put you on the spot. It's an overwhelming question, Inez, because I am uh, watching, of course, Vanderpump Rules. I'm even watching the Vanderpump Rules spinoff, The Valley, which I saw aptly described as sad people in sad marriage, marriages doing sad things in the heat. That is a very apt description of what's happening on the Valley, but I'll do anything to watch Kristen Doty. I actually started watching the Kate Winslet show, The Regime on HBO. I'm of course watching Curb Your Enthusiasm. I'm of course watching Below Deck. Uh, I could keep going in this, but I sense that I probably shouldn't because I'm telling on myself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we look forward to some of your commentary about some of those things. I want to watch Three Body Problem. That's what I keep hearing yes. is good. I haven't yet, but that's on my list to watch. So I meant to start watching that last night, but uh, my boyfriend, who you know, uh, has been insisting on a rewatch of Malcolm in the Middle, which I'm watching for the first time. And a lot of these conversations that we are having right now can be uh, illustrated. Some of the answers can be illustrated in the 90s era, like the ultimate 90s era family friendly uh, network sitcom. Like if you think the 90s were peak human civilization, you should watch Malcolm in the Middle because you will be validated. Uh, there's like so many racial sexual storylines that are handled so much better than we're capable of right now. And it just makes you sad about the regression. So I give you a little bit of a hot take there, Inez. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, um, I'll never forget um, somebody, one of our my colleagues, Claudia, who uh, unfortunately passed about a year ago. I mean, she was an incredible woman. She she's been, she was on this podcast once. I'm really fortunate to be able to interview her. But she was also the bureau chief in Moscow uh, in the 90s for the Wall Street Journal. So, uh, I mean, and she was in Tiananmen Square when Tiananmen Square happened. I mean, she, she's an incredible uh, legacy of, of reporting from some very, very dangerous places. Um, but when she was in Moscow in the nineties, uh, 
she had a like a source, a friend there. Um, and she noticed that there was quite a bit of like uh, nostalgia for the Soviet Union, um, especially in Russia itself, in Moscow, less so in the surrounding republics. <laughs> um, anyway, but but uh, so <laughs> her, her um, she was asking her friend, you know, like, why is there nostalgia for this very repressive regime? Um, and he said, they don't miss the Soviet Union. They miss when they had teeth. Um, <laughs> and so you always have to correct yourself. A little yes. bit and wonder, do you, you know, do you remember the past uh, or your childhood, right, as, as more glorious than it was? But I think there is such an objective case yeah. to be made. Couldn't that, agree more. That um, our childhood actually did peak uh, with with sort of an optimistic vision of a, a bit of the American dream. And um, that's not to say that that there weren't serious cracks in the foundations. And I think those cracks started a lot earlier than a lot of people think. And I think they were there in the 90s. But um I, this is the point. I think we actually have an objective basis for our nostalgia. I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more. Uh, with that, we'll we'll wrap up. Thank you, Emily, once again, as always, for, for coming on High Noon. Thanks for having me. And thank you to our listeners. High Noon with Inez Stepman, including After Dark, is a production of the Independent Women's Forum. As always, you can send comments and questions to Inez.Stepman at IWF.org. Please help us out by hitting the subscribe button and leaving us a comment or review on Apple Podcasts, Acast, Google Play, YouTube, or IWF.org. Be brave, and we'll see you next time on High Noon.